I'm going to firstly talk about gene expression studies and uh, a, a study of microbial infections in genomic or gene expression subtypes of CFS, and secondly, on our efforts to develop a SNP-based test, that's a single nucleotide polymorphism-based test for gene expression subtypes. Well, you're probably bored with this by now, and this is our uh, paper that we've published in 2005, where we showed in this pilot study, 16 genes were abnormally expressed in the blood of chronic fatigue syndrome patients. And we went on to show that um, in addition to these 16, um, there, were, there was a further uh, 72 genes that were abnormally expressed in the blood of CFS patients. And these were identified using a microarray and the results confirmed by quantitative PCR. And this figure shows the gene levels in CFS patients in the cross-hatched bars and normals in black. And 85 of these genes were upregulated and three of them were downregulated. And based on the gene list, certain diseases and disorders and molecular cellular functions were implicated. And most of these have links with chronic fatigue syndrome, what is already known and published on this disease. Well, approximately half of these genes were invariably raised in CFS and uh, in comparison with the normal group. And the other 44 had a lot of heterogeneity, which means they were up and down all over the place. And we were trying to link genes with clinical symptoms. And it wasn't until we used this experiment of clustering, which um, is able to identify subgroups of patients with similarities in gene expression levels. And in this study, we found seven uh, subgroups of patients on, in a clustering experiment with similar, similar gene expression levels. And these are the numbers of patients in each subgroup, subtype. And when we looked at their clinical features, they were quite markedly different which is very interesting because heterogeneity in CFS is a feature that's been recognized for decades, but uh, a reproducible means of subtyping has not been available. So we might have stumbled upon such a means. And this shows the clinical features uh, in terms of the SF36 scores for the seven subtypes, uh, a scale of not to 100 for the domains of the SF36. And just looking at this, you can see that the, each of these is quite different. About four of these were statistically significantly different. <clears throat> when we looked at the other um, questionnaire data, the fatigue, pain, uh, associated symptoms, and sleep quality, there were differences as well. And differences, too, in the symptoms, each individual symptom, headaches, sore throat, cognitive dysfunction, etc and neurocognitive uh, function shown in the dotted lines. There was a suggestion, too, that there were differences in the geographical distribution of the subtypes, although this was not statistically significant. Interesting, too, there were five genes within our ADH gene signature, which had therapeutic potential, and these genes are shown here. This gene is involved in Alzheimer's disease and is an amyloid uh, processing gene. Um, this is a, a lymphocyte receptor. This is a cancer gene. This is a IL-6 signal transducer, and this is TNF-alpha receptor. And these are the subtypes, one to seven, and these X's indicate those uh, subtypes in which each of these gene levels was shown to be raised greater than 1.5 uh, between CFS subtype compared with normal people. And this column here shows the drug which uh, is known to interact with these. And some of these are experimental and not yet licensed, and other, others of these are licensed. 
and used in cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis and other conditions. So there's therapeutic potential uh, in these four genes and these uh, drugs that interact with them. Five genes, I'm sorry. So we repeated this because you can find that, that you get a phenomenon in one study that isn't repeatable. And it did confirm uh, we tested 88 genes in 62 new patients and 29 normal blood donors. All these were according to Fukuda CDC criteria. Within the CFS group, we had um, six patients with Q fever triggered chronic fatigue syndrome. And these were part of the Birmingham outbreak and were supplied by David Honeybourne and Professor John Ayers. Um, and they, they, their disease was known to be triggered following acute phase Q fever infection. And they had been followed for several years. And in the clustering experiment, we showed that these uh, five of these six clustered in the same subtype, which is very interesting. And that suggests that the one possible explanation for our uh, gene expression subtypes is a prolonged host response that might be specific to each individual infection. That's quite an exciting uh, possibility. When we clustered these data for the 62 patients, as well as the 55 patients in the first study, um, we find that there were eight genomic subtypes, again with distinctly different phenotypes. And this shows the full difference values for each CFS subtype. This is an average value compared with normals. Most of these genes are upregulated, as shown in the red color, and several of them are downregulated, as shown in green. And the numbers of patients in each subtype are shown here. These are small groups in some cases, um, but we started with only 117 patients. And this again shows similar clinical data for these uh, eight subtypes, uh, the SF36, the other uh, uh, symptoms, and the geographical distribution, which was again suggested, uh, suggestive of differences. We've tested two positive control groups now, um, 25 Gulf War illness patients, uh, supplied by Nancy Klimas and Marianne Fletcher at the University of Miami, and 15 endogenous depression cases. And these were from uh, the Bristol area, supplied by Professor David Nutt. And we tested them for the 88 CFS-associated genes and found that in Gulf War illness, there were 63 uh, genes abnormally expressed. 11 were upregulated, 52 downregulated. And in endogenous depression, uh, five of these 88 genes were differentially expressed. Uh, all five were upregulated, and two of those are known to be upregulated in endogenous depression. So this is interesting because obviously depression occurs in CFS, but it's known to be a secondary phenomenon. But this endogenous depression is a primary depression. And so there has been some talk that CFS patients may be depressed. Well, this is evidence that endogenous depression and CFS are distinct diseases with a distinct pathogenesis. So I've mentioned already one hypothesis for, well, the question is what do these, what do these genomic subtypes mean? What are they? And we don't really understand is the answer. But uh, one possibility is that they may represent host responses to individual infections possibly the triggering infections in each individual uh, patient. So we tested for a variety of uh, microbial um, markers, Epstein-Barr virus, enterovirus, parvovirus, Coxiella burnettii, chlamydia pneumoniae, all have been linked with uh, triggering chronic fatigue syndrome. We tested also Bartonella quintana and Bartonella henselii because we found that in the CFS group, 40 were IgM positive to chlamydia, which was either very, very interesting or unbelievable. 
And um, it's known that um, serological assays, uh, there is antigenic cross-reactivity between these two. But when we repeated this with a microimmunofluorescence test, um, we found that there were very few IgM positive. So that was a false situation thrown up by the ELISA test for the IgM chlamydia. And we only found one patient positive for IgM for Bartonella quintana. So we did find some acute infections, and there were four enterovirus acute infections. But that's difficult to explain, because this is this ELISA kit tested for um, many, many serotypes of enteroviruses. Um, and there was not available ent enterovirus ELISA kits for the individual serotypes. We found one uh, parvovirus B19, IgM positive. Um, and we found um, six uh, Coxiella burnettii phase <coughs> two IgG positive, which is the acute phase marker. Um, five of these were the QCFS patients. And one of these was um, another patient with an unknown um, etiology. We did find, we looked for associations between the antibody teeters in each CFS subtype um, across the CFS subtypes and with the normal group and found some interesting things with EBV markers. The viral capsid antigen IgM varied uh, significantly across the subtypes, and that is um, this one here. It doesn't look so interesting on this graph, but that's because it is combined with these other markers of much higher level. But it was significant across the subtypes. The other interesting one was the Epstein-Barr virus nuclear antigen IgG, um, which is this one. And this is known to be um, a marker of resolved infection or late phase infection. So the normals had a very high uh, level of that, whereas the CFS patients had a much lesser level. When we looked at EBV serostatus, um, we saw some associations too. EBV serostatus is a composite of these four markers. Viral caps capsid antigen IgM, VCA IgG, early antigen IgG, and EBNA IgG. So this um, part of the histogram shows all the CFS patients compared with all of the normals. And this shows that um, this distribution was significantly different, by the way, this uh, com comparison of these two groups. There was much um, raised seronegative uh, group here compared to the normal, and the primary reactivation uh, proportion was much raised in the CFS group too. And this group was then spread out across all the subtypes. And you can see uh, an interesting phenomenon with subtype E. These are low numbers, so it can be considered pilot data only. But this distribution was significant also, as shown here. Now, I've mentioned to you before that 12 of these genes in the signature are linked uh, already with EBV infection. And when we looked at the uh, 10 of these genes across the eight subtypes, you can see a very marked and significant uh, distribution, uh, variation across these subtypes of these 10 genes. What it means, we don't yet know, but it does seem to be very interesting. One of the problems with uh, a gene expression-based uh, means of subtyping patients is that this is a very variable method. It's normalized in two different ways, and it really is difficult to reproduce precisely from one test run to the other. Um, so there are a lot of problems with that in terms of applying it to an individual, to individual patients. Um, it probably is possible, but it would take a, an enormous amount of work to do so. So one of, one of the ideas that we had was to develop 
a SNP-based test for genomic subtype. These SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, are distributed throughout the human genome. There are millions of them. Within one gene, there may be 300 to 1,000 or more, depending on the size of the gene. So we did a, a pilot study to determine whether this could be possible um, and looked at five SNPs per gene of our 88 CFS-associated genes in all CFS patients, in the normal people, and in depression. We also looked at ancestry informative markers, which may also be relevant here. And these are SNPs which are known to predict the ancestral origin of individuals. So we find that 35 SNPs, uh, SNP alleles, uh, showed a significantly different distribution across the CFS normal depression groups using chi-squared testing, and 25 differed significantly between across the CFS subtypes. And there was some overlap between these two groups, interestingly. However, to date, we don't have enough. Um, we don't have genomic subtype prediction based on these 25, but we're currently looking at the genes um, represented by these 25 SNPs to do more SNP testing in the hope that we will find better resolution when we include additional SNPs. Um, in the Ancestry Informative Markers, 110 subtype patients were of Western European origin, as we would expect. They were mostly from UK and USA, um, and four um, were Asian. Just to acknowledge our, my uh, CFS group and clinical collaborators and funding bodies. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, that was a great talk, very interesting. But could you define the word significantly for me, the way you do it? Because I find that word is often very misused. Well, there's probably a number of definitions of that word, but um, in terms of the testing that we have done, I would say that that indicates that when we use the word significantly, it is a relationship unexpected to occur by chance. And uh, for this, we use statistical tests with p-values less than or equal to 0 0.05. Perhaps I can ask you a question. When my group started looking at ME patients, CFS patients, I worked with James Mowbray, and we looked for enteroviruses, and we did polyethylic glycol precipitation to look for complexes. And we actually found enterovirus antigen in quite a proportion where the serology was negative. Mm -hmm. I think enteroviruses are quite a conundrum because um, well, the work of John Chia and the fact that they are thought not to persist and that generally RNA viruses are thought not to persist but John's work is fine and others find that they do persist um, so they're definitely acute uh, triggers of acute uh, disease and triggers of chronic fatigue syndrome but the actual explanation uh, is unknown of, of the uh, their exact pathogenesis. How could we do, uh, use the research that you've done uh, in taking that back to either our local GPs or these uh, ME centers that are set up in the country and ask them to use this as a basis for either identifying our ME or helping to treat it? Because some of the drugs you said are available, but they, they're specific to the subgroups. Yeah, I think there's two ways that we can approach treatment. Well, this is my view. Uh, well, maybe three. There are generally symptomatic supportive treatments, uh, and then um, there are treatments based on the immune response. Then there will be antiviral treatments based on those viruses that are shown to reactivate or trigger. Uh, and then there would be um, the approach that I illustrated there. We have five genes of therapeutic potential. How, how has our work uh, 
going to help patients? How can it be used? Um, well, I've applied for money to do clinical trials based on a couple of those gene drug interactions and was refused. Um, I think the infection uh, angle could be very fruitful, and I think at present the investigation of infections in CFS is extremely rudimentary, and most people don't get any infected, anti, you know, don't get tested for uh, markers of infection. Um, but I think that hopefully soon we will have some links between the subtypes and infections, and we will also have a, a SNP-based test for genomic subtype, which will then guide the uh, investigation of uh, possible infection in CFS patients. There has been two or three clinical studies of giving anti-TNF, TNF tumor necrosis factor is an inflammatory cytokine which can be found in the CSF and also in the circulation. And TNF, anti-TNF has been given into the spinal canal in patients with Alzheimer's in a preliminary clinical study and shown quite marked benefit. In view of what you show, do you think this would be an interesting approach for chronic fatigue? Well, the intrathecal administration of anti-TNF drugs, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but there has been a pilot study uh, using a tanercept in six uh, CFS patients which were diagnosed according to Fukuda criteria, and all six showed s some marked degree of improvement. Um, unfortunately, this study was not published as a paper but was presented a, as an abstract at the Seattle IACFS meeting in 2001. So there is uh, data to support the use of anti-TNF drugs in CFS. One last question, that lady there. Thinking about things very simplistically, um, from the, the particular gene groups that you've identified, would it not be possible to look for those gene groups in the population and then try and develop vaccines against all these possible um, chronic infective factors as a way of protecting certain vulnerable groups in the population? Do you mean that's prior to development of CFS or after development of CFS? Well, prior to. I mean, what's the point of doing it afterwards? Unless you can tell me the reason, that will be fine. I don't understand it, It's a things. complicated, well, as, as we understand it at the moment, it's a complicated uh, pathogenesis where um, you've got infection, you've got exposure to toxic compounds, pesticides, chemicals. You've got the effect of stress on the immune system. Um, so to develop a vaccine to cover all of that will be very difficult, I think. Well, the vaccine wouldn't cover all those things, but surely if you to take out the infective element, you might disable some of the process. But I think the triggering factor for, well, yeah, it can be discussed, but I think it would be very difficult to do because the triggering infection for each individual might be different. It's impossible logistically. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. Kerr, thank Excellent. you. Thank you.